Okay. Nice. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second lecture that I'm doing for this course. Um, and uh, today we are going to have a look at the error handling in Rust. So uh, this is a very important topic and a pretty uh, integrated one in the Rust language. So uh, um, if you talked a little bit about its history earlier, then you will know that uh, everybody, if you hear about Rust, you will sort of think, oh, it's a safe language. It's a fast language. And uh, it's also quite easy work with even though uh, the compiler will sometimes feel like your enemy <clears throat> today we will learn that uh, even though the compiler is annoying it is actually your friend and uh, we will take a look at how you can handle errors in your code whether those be errors that you've made or that your users make while using your program um, so the overview of today starts with unrecoverable uh, and recoverable errors, recoverable errors, <clears throat> using the result type, the question mark operator. We're going to have a end of day quiz like last time, and we are going to have two like mini assignments that you can like do to get some practical experience. Uh, they should take like five minutes, uh, but it's nice to like uh, do it yourself once at least, and then you can ask questions if there's anything uh, you're unsure about uh, the chat will be open at all times and at the end we're having a quick written QA and I'm also briefly going to mention something called anyhow which is a nice uh, error handling library so uh, <clears throat> which ties nicely into the whole rust ecosystem but uh, that's completely optional I would say so uh, Let's start with unrecoverable errors. Uh, before I reveal some, um, if you can think of anything that's like unrecoverable in traditional programming, um, something that would maybe cause undefined behavior or crash the program or something like that, or if you've encountered something in Rust already, um, feel free to type it in the chat uh, now or just speak up and then we can see if we agree on things. And uh, if there are no immediate thoughts, that's perfectly OK as well. Um, in that case, I've prepared a couple of errors for you. Yeah, accessing memory that's, uh, that you're not allowed to touch is definitely something <laughs> that's going to, that's uh, probably known as like as a seg fault on Linux, usually. Uh, accessing memory that you're not allowed, to, or accessing operating system memory as well. Um, that's a good one. Um, also, so reading out of bounds of an array and a vector is basically just exactly that, because then you're trying to read memory outside of uh, where you're allowed to read. So an array or a vector will have, for example, 10 elements. If you try to read the 11th uh, element, that's, uh, that's illegal because you don't have access to it and there's nothing there that you care about. Uh, accessing invalid memory address is also the same thing you mentioned, just uh, <clears throat> this can be lower addresses that are reserved for operating systems or reading memory from other programs. Uh, null pointers, at least in other languages, you have uh, have that concept. Um, and usually null pointers and null ability is, uh, at least in C and C++ and other languages, is uh, usually like the number one cause of errors, like memory errors is pretty much the most prevalent one. Uh, then we have divide by zero, since that's undefined. And uh, once now that we've had a look at some examples, um, we can look at uh, some tools that Rust have to deal with those. So we will do this in a practical code example a bit later. But uh, for now, let's just get an overview of the various most common functions. So, uh, we have panic, which is the most brute force way of simply triggering an error on your own. So you could think of this somewhat like throwing an error in other programs, although uh, unlike throwing an error or like an exception, uh, this just <laughs> this panics your whole program. So it, it just stops, basically. So there's no recovery from that, which is why it's called panic. 
and the exclamation mark is because it's a it's a macro. Uh, so it's uh, triggered in the case of an unrecoverable error. You can do it yourself and just say this is a panic. I, I, if you reach this part of my code, you are basically there's no way out of this. Or other libraries that you use can trigger them. Or uh, dividing by zero and or any of these issues that we just looked at uh, are also uh, going to trigger panic. So panic is sort of Rust's equivalent of an exception, except it's even harder than that. It's like more brutal. And uh, so they're not the same. But if you want to relate it to other languages, that's the closest thing you can get to. Except usually in other languages, you can catch exceptions. And there's not really a distinction in other languages between a recoverable and unrecoverable error. Usually they are all abstracted away as exceptions. Um, or, well, I guess in C or in other languages like that, you can get just uh, seg faults and crashes, that hard crash that you can't recover from. But there's no language feature like a panic to deal with it, sort of. Um, then we have unwrap, which uh, is a way to uh, unwrap a result or a panic if it's an error. So if you have something, an operation that you're doing, um, but you all you want it to be uh, succeeding, you want it to be a success, or it has to panic your program. Like if it, if you can't do this successfully, then the program is in an invalid state, and you want to you panic and you crash basically. So it's a cheap say way of saying I don't want to handle an error. Uh, which then triggers a panic, which is unrecoverable. Uh, and you can also use it if you are 100% sure there cannot be an error <laughs> when you're calling the code. So if you control the entire data flow and you all know that it's always called with a certain value, or if you know whatever this is hard-coded to always work, but the compiler can't know it, then you can use unwrap to just simply get access to the success case without uh, deal handling an error or so. And then you have expect, which is unwrap with a bit extra sugarcoating. So you can add an error message if it crashes. So uh, in the case where it crashes, you will get an error printed to the console or your terminal, um, which can be useful if uh, you want the user to know why the program crashed. So unwrap is better used when there is no information to be had, or if you're, you know, if you know there can't be an error, it's the fastest way to just ignore it. But today will not be as much about ignoring errors as about actually handling them. Um, so unrecoverable errors are probably and generally, uh, I would say, caused by the programmer. That's uh, that's you or an invalid invariant in your program. So uh, usually this is like, if you're trying to read the 11th element of a 10 sized array, that's your fault and not the user. Um, if you're trying to divide by zero, that could be the user's fault if you were dealing with user input, but then really it's your fault for not uh, <laughs> validating the user input. Uh, Accessing invalid memory is usually also your fault because users uh, often don't deal with memory directly when using your program, unless you are maybe writing a memory inspector or something like that. But then you really should, <laughs> and it's really your responsibility in the end anyway. So most of these are your fault. Uh, but then we also have the concept of an invalid invariant. So if you have a type that says, a uh, positive, positive number, you create your own struct that is called positive number. And then you try to construct this type with a negative number. Then you're sort of, you're invalidating the invariant that this type sort of promises to uphold. So the type promises that it will only ever have positive numbers, but you're breaking that assumption by giving it a negative number. And that can cause a panic because the, the program is now in an invalid state. It's not doing what it's promised anymore. Uh, so the compiler, in the end, is your friend. In many cases, it will inform you about a lot of the things that are wrong with your code at compile time. So 
it can catch uh, with when you're working with threads. Uh, it will deal with most data race conditions and uh, uh, multiple access because it will know. Uh, I don't know if you we, you have spoken about the borrow checker in detail, but uh, uh, what? Not yet. No. Okay. Well. Uh, anyway, uh, the borrow checker is a huge reason of why we can consider the compiler to be your friend because it will know that you're trying to write at multiple places and read at the same time. It tracks all of these things that you're trying to do as a programmer. And then in the end, it will warn you while you compile if it detects something that's unsafe, uh, that will can cause a race condition because it doesn't have to. Because you can, you can write perfectly safe code in other languages without these checks, but these checks sort of guarantee that you can't uh, trigger a lot of common mistakes, usually around memory safety. And those are also the ones that are most common to crash your program. And the fact that this compiler and the borrow checker in Rust is so aggressive is part of the reason why Rust is considered a safe language, because a lot of the common pitfalls of other languages are blocked by the compiler at uh, compile time. So um, unfortunately for beginners, this can cause a lot of headache because suddenly you have all of these errors that you or warnings that you have to deal with before you can actually run your code. And some of them you don't even understand because um, the, the compiler is using some ling like lingo that's uh, specific to Rust, like the borrow checker and the uh, you have to sort of learn how to deal with the mistakes as well. But in the end, once you get used to the fact that the compiler is just helping you, and the fact that if you know that your code compiles, you can be pretty sure it's not going to crash or be unstable. You can be pretty sure that you have an error-free program. Um, it's really worth it. So uh, that, that being said, uh, the compiler cannot detect like semantic issues. So if you have logical flaws in your program that are technically correct, like if you're writing a game in Rust and you have gravity going upwards, that's technically correct, but the, the compiler can't detect it obviously because it doesn't know if you want to have gravity upwards or downwards. So uh, it can detect like language issues, memory issues and data access issues. But uh, if there are logical flaws, then of course that's uh, that's your fault again. And that's also why if you try to access uh, arrays out of bounds, if you have fixed sized arrays, I'm pretty sure the compiler can detect it if it's a hard coded value. But um, with dynamically sized ones, it's a lot harder. So. But uh, the main takeaway is that uh, while the compi compiler errors can be annoying, um, they are definitely there to help you. and. If your program compiles and your logic is sane, you can pretty much trust that the program will work as intended. Yeah. Um, so let's look at recoverable errors um, with some examples. I think these were supposed to animate in so we could have some user input. But uh, uh, some examples are opening a file that does not exist. Um, if you try to do that, you technically can handle this error because it's not fatal. You can simply say that if the file doesn't exist, you can warn the user and ask them to point to another file. Or parsing a JSON file and there's some syntax errors in the JSON, you can simply print the syntax error or handle it any other way you want. Also reading user input in an expected format, but then the user ends up screwing up. Like you ask for a number, but they write a string. Um, you can definitely recover from that. And this is like, if you don't recover from this or validate this, then you could end up in a state where it's unrecoverable. For example, if you ask for a number for a division, if you write a calculator and you allow the user to divide by zero, then you could you know, end up in a bad state. But uh, if you actually handle and validate the input, so you say, hey, you can't divide by zero, uh, then you can still recover. But of course, depending on your program, some of these could be unrecoverable. For example, if uh, you're looking for a configuration file with lots of API keys and important data, and this does not exist, um, or some other like 
data that's absolutely required, you could say as a programmer that this mistake we, we just can't recover. Uh, it's the user has not configured their program. So, I mean, it's rare that you simply can't recover. You could have a pop-up, but depending on the program and the uh, boundaries that you are programming within, some of these could, of course, be unrecoverable in the context. But generally, like these are nice examples of recoverable errors. And if you have any other uh, thoughts about uh, a recoverable error, you can just type it in the chat and we can add it to the list of examples. Um, but overall, uh, an error that you can recover from is more likely to be caused by a user. And it forces you to think about uh, error cases, how you can avoid them, or how you can deal with them, or in some cases, ignore them. Um, and it describes an error that can be handled without crashing the program as the only way out. So some, like we talked about, some errors, you if you reach that state, the program is invalid and you have to crash. Uh, but any error, error that you can recover from without crashing the program, you can think of as recoverable while you're coding. And in Rust, there is usually a type that's called the result type that describes such, an, such types of errors. And uh, we haven't talked about generic types yet, but uh, the T and the E in the brackets uh, is... Uh, stand-ins for the success type and the error type. So um, when you write a result, in the success case, it will return a T, which can be an integer, a float, uh, or a string. Or in the error case, it will return an E. And the E can be something like input error, IO error, network error, data access error, or an operating system error. There are lots of different uh, error types that can go into the E field. So uh, we will use this in a practical example, and then you will use it in the, in the small mini tasks uh, after. Uh, and the whole point of this is that it defines the success and error type, and it represents something that can fail. And um, when you're using it, um, and you see a function that returns a result, that basically means that the responsibility is on you as the caller of that function to handle the uh, result, um, which is often better than, especially if you're writing your own functions. Sometimes it's better to delegate the error handling to the caller, especially if it's like low level functions. So then the higher level functions can decide how to handle the error in the context that it's happening. So if you're dealing with user input, you might not want the read in function to deal choose what happens if the user reads a string you can delegate that to the caller because um, they might may want to do different things um, of course sometimes uh, it's okay of course to do it in the low level and just handle it right away so in the read int you might want to loop this function until it's until you get the valid integer but um, most of the time like the read in function will not know uh, what is a valid integer in the context. So it will only say return the integer, and then whoever calls it can, if it's a success, uh, validate the integer, and if not, call it again. Uh, but if it's an error, it can also give it to the caller, so the caller can decide what's the appropriate response in this context. So um, oftentimes you want to Oops. Um, delegate the results to the callers instead of handling errors yourself in a lower level context. So you should always ask yourself, is it sensible to handle the error here or should I return the result type instead and just uh, let whoever called me decide? Uh, and the basic syntax here is, for example, when you're trying to open a file, the cargo.tumble file, um, you can match on the result because a result is an enum and it can be either okay or error. Um, so 
okay is the success case of the result type and error is the error type of the uh, result type. So um, if you look here, that there's the T and the E, when there's a success, which is the okay, then you will um, handle a T. And in case of opening a file, the success type is a file type or a file handle. And the, in the error case, uh, it's simply some type of IO error since it's dealing with a file in this case. Okay. Uh, this will become more clear as we uh, dive into the examples. So before we progress with the slides, let's uh, uh, do what use what we have learned and uh, do it in a practical way. And if you have any questions so far, just uh, pop them in the chat. Um, so let's work with one of the recoverable types first. And uh, since they are the most important to deal with uh, and recoverable, we can simply uh, trigger a few to see, see what happens. Um, so let's start by writing a function that is, uh, yeah, let's use the read, uh, read in. Let's start with the read stream. Um, and uh, we simply want to return a string from this uh, to begin with. But, uh, and then we take our uh, command. So first we create uh, a variable that we uh, put a string, just create a new string. And we are going to call it the out string for now. And then here we use uh, the IO library in the standard library. We use the standard input and we call read line and we read it into out string, which we should have should make mutable. So we can actually write to it. And here, let's get rid of that. And on the last line, we go out string. Um, however, read line, if we take a look at it, uh, I control click to go to the definition. Uh, we can see that the result returns a result. Uh, that means something can go wrong if we read this. And maybe it says so in the documentation. Um, it does not say exactly why, but uh, what could go wrong is that if you cancel your standard input, if you hit control C usually, you will simply not read anything. Uh, you can end up reading nothing. You can get uh, weird data. So there are sure ways, certainly ways that this can fail. Right now, however, however, if we just compile, uh, we see that it uh, really doesn't care since it returns the result type, but uh, it's up to us to handle it. And if it reads nothing, this string simply becomes empty, um, which isn't a good experience if we want to know that something went wrong. So now the caller of this function will always get a string, but the string could be empty or it could have data in it. But they don't know if, it, there's, if it's a valid read. And this function by itself is, does not know where it's going to be called. It could be used to read names. Uh, postal codes, I guess, uh, addresses. Um, so we want to indicate to the caller that something went wrong instead of handling it inside of this one. We could also um, simply ignore any error and say that if, it cr if there's an error with the input, we just crash. So this is sort of forcing this to become unrecoverable in the case of an error with reading the stream. Uh, but we will start by actually just returning um, the result. So instead of returning a string from this, we want to do a result. And then we also need to figure out the error type. So most likely it's stored in the same module as the uh, function itself. 
and then maybe we find an error in there and uh, that may have been the right one we'll have to see uh, and we'll get back to a nicer way of dealing with this uh, so first we actually need to assign the result to something so we know that uh, since we're passing an immutable reference to outstring we want to after this line we know that something has happened to it we have either written nothing or the string we read so now we are assigning the result to a variable and then we need to know um deal with uh, is this a success or is it an error so if we use the this as an example uh, we can uh, try to do it locally first so so let our bytes read which is why you see it says result u size uh, that's because reading the line uh, returns uh, how many bytes it read from the strings so if we type three ascii characters it would uh, probably have read three bytes so that then you would get three uh, in return and here you also see that the result type is in fact the IO result. And if we control click that, we see that that's simply an alias for the regular result type with uh, a type T, which in this case is the bytes read. And the error is uh, an IO type error for read, write, and seek. So this is how you can figure out uh, where and what the various types are. Um, so let's match the results. In the case of OK, there's a number of bytes. And, and then we have the error case, which uh, comes with an error. Um, but uh, we have our result type for this function is a string and the IO error. Um, so in this case, we actually don't care about the number of bytes we have read. We only care that uh, it's a success. So we have read something or it's an error. So uh, like we've done before, when the last expression in a function doesn't have is an expression and doesn't have a semicolon, this is used as the return value. And since it's a match, both of these branches need to have the same value so that in the OK case, it will return this one. And in the error case, it will return this one. <coughs> um, so the basic approach right now will be to, if it's OK, then we know that we read data so then we can use our outstream but since our return type is a result uh, then we have to wrap it in the result type which is okay and we can say that it's our outstream if it's an error uh, we want to simply return the same error that we just got so we can simply go error error so now we've taken this um, result from this one which returns the result with a number of bytes or an io error uh, we've parsed the result with a match so saying if it's okay then we're converting it to a result which is okay with a string and in the error case we're simply pushing the error up so whoever calls this function can deal with it so if we go in here and we go cargo build everything should be fine except that it's we get a warning that it's dead code because this is not used yet but we can use it here so let's say let the data equals our read string so now in our main function we have have our results um, which means in the main function which is where we're calling read string we can now decide what to do with this result so to begin with let's and this is something you will do sometimes during development let's simply call unwrap to ignore the error and just see if the function works in the happy case so now we see we unwrap it and now it becomes a string like it forces it to become the 
the success dive it's forced and if that fails then we panic and we hard crash and are it's unrecoverable and then we simply want to print our data um so let's try that assuming that this console works it does now we type something like hello and it prints what we type so that's hello uh, let's see if we can actually crash it yes um but uh, instead of using unwrap uh, we want to probably handle it in the main as well so let's say this program is about um, writing a string that's longer than a certain value so uh, here we can again use match on the data and say okay this is the string and in the error case it's just an error so here we want to say that um, yeah, if the strings length is greater than five uh, we want to print that uh, okay you're good uh, and in the other case uh, this should not uh, this should loop so we want to get read the data until we're reaching this point and in the error case let's uh, let's just print it and uh, otherwise we don't care so uh, uh well to do this let's just put it in a simple loop um since we don't care very much more than that and then we have to remember in the okay good we have to break the loop and in the else we don't really need because it will just keep looping um so let's try this. Now I can write, hey, which is not, uh, well, we should actually put, print an error message to the user here. More than five characters, please. So if we do it now, we write, hey, we actually get feedback. Uh, so now we're doing some input validation uh, based on the error that we got here and we parse the result and if there should be an error then uh, it will be printed here but uh, let's use four five characters and then we're okay good since we're the backslash n like the enter key is also part of this that's why we get uh, more than five um so let's move this to a new file for now and call it um, result example 01 call it result example 01 and here we go back to the main declare our module like we have done before and then we can call, make sure this is public and call the result example of one. Actually, we need to do this unless we use it. Let me comment it out. So later when we publish the code, you can use this to look at that. So that's the basic pattern. Um, we produce some results in this case we're propagating we're like taking the result from this one we're doing something with it and then send converting it to another type of result and then in our calling function that sort of knows the flow of the program uh, we're using this result again we're doing some validation if it's good then we're printing more error messages if it's uh, if it's not good and then in doing that in a loop so um, Let's uh, progress a little bit with the slides. Um, 
So uh, if we look at this, it's uh, quite uh, <laughs> verbose. It takes a lot of space to always use match result and convert things, especially if we're just going to propagate errors up to callers anyway. So there's a solution for that, and that's called the question mark operator. Uh, uh, when you have multiple opportunities of error inside of a function, uh, it can cause messy code when returning. Uh, and uh, this one propagates the error case to the return value, or it assigns the value in case of success. So what that means, it's like, it's a bit like unwrap, except for recoverable errors. So uh, when you use the question mark in the code, you will either have the success value, which is what unwrap does, except it forces it. Uh, but if you don't get the success value, then it actually just returns a result with an error already encoded. So it saves you quite a few lines, especially if you're working with uh, uniform error types, like the same standard IO errors. And it's a lot cleaner to read, and it avoids a lot of manual error cases that you just want to propagate anyway. So, But if you want to handle errors locally, then you don't use this. So this is only for sending errors up. Um, yeah. So uh, before we go on the at the panic examples, let's just uh, do one more example where we use our uh, question mark. Let's create this one. Declare it. Result example question mark. And we paste our read string, but the, now we are going to call it as read file instead. We don't know the type yet. Um, so first, let's create the file that we want to read. So in just in the read folder, uh, I'm going to create a file and call it uh, data.txt. Hello, this is a file. We're reading it from Rust. So this is now our data.txt file that we want to read. Um, and we always want to read uh, this particular file. So let's start by maybe using our file and see if we can open it but that we can and we let our file be equal to equal to this file so the path to this uh, if i'm not mistaken will just be data.txt since when you run the program at least from idea uh, the working directory will be the root of your project so everything that's in the root should be accessible without an absolute path but we could of course uh, prefix it with an absolute path but if you run it from the terminal, then you, have, you need to make sure that uh, this file is in the same folder that you're running it from. Which is why when we're in our root folder, error handling, and use cargo run, that's why it's uh, working from there from the terminal as well. Uh, as we can see, this returns a result. Uh, we don't know which one, so let's go inside. We see it's an IO result. Uh, and then it's probably also an error here. And that's also an IO error or IO. Then we can say that our return type is a result. Uh, it produces a file. Um, I don't know if we our output will be a file. We just, it will probably be a string since we're reading the file. Uh, but the error type will be the IO error. Um, so before, if we now want to read the file, we would have had to done a match file. And then if it's okay, in that case, we can then read the file. Uh, but you can see this can quickly become a lot of nesting if it's there. It's a lot of operations that depend on each other. So, so if we keep going with this and say like, uh, Okay, so let's create a mutable buffer string. 
and then use our file to read the string. And we put in our mutable reference to the buffer and let that result equals that. And then in the error case, we just want to return our error. Um, and that's error with error. And here we do the buffer uh, instead of OK. And this needs to be mutable as well if you want to read from it. It still probably complains. Yeah, so anyway, this is not how we're going to do it for now. Um, but you can see if this, again, resulted in yet another step, because now we have another result, uh, it becomes a lot of nesting. So there's this is where the question mark operator comes in. So uh, instead, we can simply do this. Uh, that's a lot nicer, since all we want to do anyway is that if it's an error, we want to pass it to the caller. So by doing question mark, if this is an error, we now return from the function here. That's the same as going uh, match. And then if it's an error, we return. But if it's a success, then we simply assign to the variable file. And uh, we don't have to uh, deal with the result there. We start, we're delegating responsibility to the caller, which is very nice because that means we can now uh, read the file. Uh, we need our string again. So let's create our buffer. I'll say new string. And then we can pass it in as a buffer. Uh, but um, this also produces a result like we saw. So let's just use the question mark here as well. And now uh, we can say bytes red, like so. Uh, so now this is not a result either because we are using the question mark, which will then, if this is an error, uh, return it. Uh, finally, we can now we should now have data in our strings. So just for debug purposes, let's just print uh, we read bytes and put in the bytes read here, just for ourselves. And then at the end we can say OK and the buffer, which then returns our red file. Uh, so let's test this function. Let's just call read file. And to for to begin with, let's just uh, call unwrap to test it. And then in our main function, let's use our function and then call it here. Example question. Um, so let's have a look. Uh, so now we see, yeah, we read 83 bytes, which is uh, probably correct. And we get the success case. Um, let's actually use uh, our string here. Let our data be equal to this one. Uh, and also let's give this a return type. Let's give it the same return type. And let's not unwrap it anymore. Um, so now this one is a result as well. Uh, keep in mind that the main function is also allowed to return a result. Um, should be allowed to just do IO error. Yeah. And then if it if your main fails with an error, so you can use the question mark here as well, which will then end your terminate your program in an error, just push it up to main, or let you use it in the other case. So let's also just print the file contains and just put the data in there. But now we have to remember that if everything's OK, we just uh, say OK. And doing this is the same as saying there's no data in the success case. So let's run it. 
And now we say we read 83 bytes and the file contains, hello, this is a file we're reading, blah, 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 blah. Now we have successfully handled errors all the way from the bottom of read file, which has two possible result errors. First, on opening the file, and secondly, when reading the file. And we see that uh, uh, we read some amount of bytes. And uh, it's OK. If we get here, then it's OK. So the result is success. In our example code, we simply call the file and just pass the result up. And in main, we uh, call it and use the question mark on the main function to say that uh, we will actually trigger an error for this one <clears throat> and see what happens. And then uh, we print the contents of the file and say that the main function was success, which means it exits the program exits with the code zero. Um, so let's make this fail. Um, based on what we've looked at, can you think of uh, the easiest way to make this fail? Like, Um, yeah, whatever. Uh, in any way, yeah, yeah, exactly. Give a file name that doesn't exist. So we can just call it the datas. And then let's see what happens. Now we have our error. So error, that's an OS error. Code two, kind not found. The system cannot find the file specified. And then we get the process didn't exit successfully with an exit code one. And that's because our main has the error type. So because this is the final level of error handling, the question mark, return, mark returns an error to main, which causes our program to not exit successfully with an exit code. Uh, if we got rid of this and instead decided to handle the error in main, which uh, we might want to do, match the data. And in case of OK, we got our contents, in which case this is where we can call the print. And in the error case, we can simply print our error, which is the error. So now, um, it's not called data, it's called contents. Now if we run the program with the same, same error, uh, we now get that the, uh, the program finishes with a successful uh, code, so it gets code zero. Uh, but we simply print the error in another way. So now it just says the system can't find the file, and we exit the program normally. So if we want the program to be able to fail uh, with an exit code, then we can use the result from main. But if we just want to handle it like this, then uh, this is fine. Uh, so that's uh, the purpose of the question mark operator. And as you can see, this greatly simplifies code instead of having to nest multiple match statements when dealing with this. Um, nice. So let's keep going and just have a quick look at the panic, unwrap, and expect. Let's actually move this into our example code first. So, well, actually I will do that after, before giving you the codes. Just so we can keep the main function with all the examples. Uh, so let's look at panic, unwrap and expect. Um, if you just want the program to fail, uh, you can use panic exclamation mark and say hard crash. That's all you have to do. And then if you go cargo run, we just get, uh, well, I actually forget that this will not compile right now. My bad. But now when you run it, it says thread panicked hard crash. This is where it crashed. And uh, you get the exit, exit code 101. So if you want to hard crash, you do panic. So. We could do this, for example, in read file. Um, if something fails, we can use it in an if else. 
Uh, but uh, it's the fastest way to get your program to crash. Uh, the next way is if we, well, let's use our example one. Let's hijack that quickly and just say that uh, it will always, um, this will always um, crash. So this uses read string. Let's uh, in read string, let's return an error all the time. Uh, let's see if we even can create one of these. Yeah, let's just uh, fake an error. Yeah, let's just uh, we need an error. Uh, yeah, shit. forced error. So let's just always cause an error from read string. So now if we uh, run the program, we yeah we get forced error printed forever since we end up in this branch and it's in a loop. Uh, instead of doing that, let's uh, use unwrap to force it to be correct. So that means if this is an error, the program crashes. So let's clear and cargo run. And now we see we get a panic at the unwrap because it was an error. So um, the program now crashes because we knew wanted it to be success only, but then it's an error. And we have decided as programmers that uh, in this case, our program cannot recover. But uh, this is, uh, in this case, is very artificial. So let's use expect instead. That's the other one. Uh, this is the same, except we can provide a message. So let's say the data was forced to fail here. Uh, and then we go cargo run again. I will now see that it panicked because the data was forced to fail. And then the error is already exists forced error. And then it's the same. So the only difference between accept and unwrap is that accept provides a message. So let's undo all of that. Uh, so these are the ways of, uh, this basically produces unrecoverable errors. I think we should be good now. Except uh, that. Now we should be good. Okay, so we're going to have a short break uh, until nine twenty five, and. Uh, during that break, um, you can just try to define a function that generates a random integer. And if it's not about, like, let's say between one and 10, if it's not above a value, say five, then the function should punish. So if you, you can just create any random project or use what you have. And then to generate random numbers, just uh, get, uh, put your rand package into cargo to tumble, like rand equals. 0.8.5. And then you can go thread RNG dot and generate a range from 0 to 10. Let's make it 1 to 10 and make it inclusive. And just say number equals that. That's how you get the random number. So um, yeah, so you can. Uh, do that until 9.25, and then we will keep going from there.
Okay. Uh, let's hope that was uh, <clears throat> not too tricky. It should be just to get you familiar with uh, using the function. So uh, one way of doing this is then simply if the number is greater than five, we want to panic and say a too high number. Obviously, this is a very trivial example with no, no real backbone. But now when we run our program, it will sometimes crash and sometimes not. And it's completely random. So, uh, Of course, in a real world setting, instead of using a random number here, you could definitely say that, uh, for example, this could be opening a file, uh, a critical file, or you could have uh, <clears throat> dealing with some other important critical uh, thing of your program. And in the case that it fails, you would immediately use panic. Uh, in this case, you couldn't really use unwrap since this uh, this doesn't actually produce a result. So that's where you want to use panic. I created another one as well. Um, so we can spend a couple of minutes on that, and then I will show a possible solution. So if you want to define a function that returns a result, and then you handle it with a match case like we have done before, and if it fails, it should try to call the function again. And if it succeeds, it should print the generated number. So you can use it, you can build on this. So create a function that generates a random number. And instead of panicking, you should return an error uh, when it's less than a, uh, an arbitrary value instead of returning, instead of panicking. And then we can try to use the our loop to call the function until it succeeds. So uh, uh, I think we have we are going to just wrap up the slides before we do this, but then you will have I will give you some minutes at the end to do this, and then I will provide a, a possible solution in the code examples after the lecture. So let's mention have an honorable mention here for error handling. So uh, uh, in the way Rust is designed in many ways is, uh, let's just do this and this. Uh, for example, like the random library, uh, rand is a part of, a part of the standard library in Rust. Uh, it's an official random gen number generator, but it's used as, an, as a dependency. So you don't have it in your uh, program by default. You have to say that you need it. So, uh, and that's uh, the way uh, the language is sort of, in a way, designed. That uh, using dependencies should be frictionless, and you should have uh, access to extended functionality on top of everything that base through libraries. So, it's not a shame to use them. But uh, so anyhow, it's an, another one of these. Uh, it's completely optional, but I want to show it to you because it's uh, very useful for some types of error handling. Um, it uh, doesn't change the error handling system in Rust, of course. It just makes some things convenient. Uh, so I think it's important to mention, but we won't spend too much time on it. So basically, it has a generic error type that works for everything that implements error. Uh, and that means you don't have to look up the error type every time. It works across the board. And if you have multiple types of errors in a function, it should handle that elegantly as well. Uh, additionally, it allows some context uh, information that you can provide, which makes means it makes error messages more uh, readable. And since it's more intuitive, it encourages actually error handling better because it's a little bit faster to work with it. So if we just take our question mark example, um, let's just convert take the exact same function and use it as read file anyhow. Um, so what are the things that it's, we can simplify now? Uh, first of all, before we had to specify uh, the IO error all the time. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. We can use uh, the anyhow error. And that works for uh, uh, basically every kind of error. So we don't have to look it up anymore. 
And if we just take our example, fu uh, example function here, we can uh, well, we can once again re-implement it. But instead of using read file, we let's use uh, read file anyhow. Actually, let's uh, use both of them so we can see the difference. So let's go anyhow and uh, regular. Now we call, uh, have two functions. So let's start by running the program right now. Now it's using datas.txt, which doesn't exist. So let's look at the default printing of errors. I have to call it as well. Like so. Now let's look at it. Um, so right now they look uh, more or less exactly the same. So regular error the system can file and anyhow error the system cannot file. So that's perfectly normal. Um, the main difference here, like if you don't want to use anything else, if you just stick to anyhow error, you at least don't have to specify anything else. And I think there's also a result. So you can even omit uh, the error type because that comes uh, pre-built with uh, the anyhow error. And then if we additionally go ahead and use, use it, not the error, but the result, we can simply use result string and uh, the error is sort of dealt with behind the scenes. And uh, if we run it now, and this works for everything, not just IO errors, it could be network errors, it could be memory errors, like anything. So that's a nice uh, way of to think about it. Uh, the second thing is that, for example, if we want more detailed error messages, uh, anyhow allows us to add a context to errors. So we can call context on any result. And here we can write trying to read datas.txt. And if we now run it, we will see that, um, first of all, the error in anyhow has changed to trying to read datas. Uh, so this adds the context, but it sort of gets rid, gets rid of the other message, which by itself isn't uh, very helpful, of course. So clearly we want to see both. Um, so here is uh, an example. Um, there are two ways to use add the context. It's just the context, which you can add a string to. And then you can use with context, which then lazily calls this in the case of an error and doesn't actually make the string unless uh, there, an error is happening. So let's try to use the other one as well. Um, here, so let's use with context, which means we now have to put it inside of a Lambda. Um, so uh, let's run it. And again, we just get that. And uh, if we now instead want to propagate this, because I think if you use push this all the way up the main, you will get a more interesting error message. Uh, and that is if we go result and string. And then here we can then simply return this function. And in main, we also make sure to use anyhow result string. And we use our question mark here as well. And now it complains, it returns nothing, which it shouldn't.
So sometimes the Rust has a bit interesting error messages. Even if you have worked with it, you will sometimes be. And your main needs to return something. So yeah, did it there. Right. But uh, this is the return, right? That is if we run. Main can only right, so it's uh, we can't use this result type, I guess. And uh, then we have yeah, because we can't use we can't return a string. That's right. That's it. And then we probably have to use the regular result here. And then we have to also go. With the OK, or we just don't ignore the question mark. Yes, but then it's nothing, and we have to, and then we have to go. Not result, okay, we don't care about. And in the error case, we want to return the error. And here we want to do nothing. Yes, but the, now when we propagate it, we get our slightly more, um, we get a bigger error message at least. So we get the trying to read data is the error. And then we get the cost by uh, the system cannot find this file specified. So uh, basically, at least when doing it this way, we get slightly more information about uh, programmer information and the actual mistake. So, uh, but that's a bit of an A side. Um, the main takeaway here is that. Uh, it's uh, sometimes better to just not have to worry about uh, the type of the error. Um, so let's wrap it up as well with the quiz. Uh, yes, that's the code. And like last time, our questions are not timed. So it's more about getting the right answer than getting the fastest answer. If you are in, can you click the heart as well? So we know how many people are in. Yeah, let's say that's uh, everyone. So let's say which is not a way to handle errors in Rust. We have unwrap, catch, expect, panic. Nice. That's true. Throwing and catching exceptions, that's uh, reserved for other languages. For the second one, what kind of error is the user is supposed to write a number, but they end up writing a string instead? Unrecoverable, recoverable, or none of them?
nice. Generally, that's a recoverable error. And it's, uh, while it's easy to blame users, this, this should be recoverable in your program. Uh, so which of these are part of the result TE enum in Rust when you see it? We have success, OK, failure, error, and error. Nice. Uh, for some reason, they decided to shorten error with error. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, at least it's better than failure. So that's TE and it's OKT OK, and error E. Uh, so, what's the purpose of the question mark operator? Writing cleaner code propagating errors to the caller, creating nullable variables, or injecting undefined behavior. Maybe I was too fast. But yes. The question marks makes error handling cleaner and it allows for more secure syntax when propagating errors. And for the final one, is it okay to sometimes not handle errors if you know the result will be okay? Um, so, uh, Yes, uh, but there's a but in 95 or more percent of the cases, uh, you should probably handle them like a good Rust coder. Um, but there are cases, I can show you one, uh, for example, where, um, where, uh, where you can ignore it. So that's nice. Congrats, M. And now there's a question slide if there are any other questions. Um, and then um, we have the case where, where we know something uh, will work out. So um, often this can be it's more relevant if we deal with the option type. I don't know if you have worked with it, but sometimes you will you will assign variables directly, like say t equals OK5. And in this case, if we want to use t, let's say uh, let the sum equals t plus 5. Uh, some like you when you know that this is always okay, uh, then you can just unwrap it because you know that it's hard coded basically to be successful. So in a case like this, um, then you can unwrap directly without uh, causing issues for your users. But this is of course, it depends that you know what you're doing. So while there's an edge case where this is possible. Um, while most of the in most of the cases anyway, you will have to do some sort of error management. So while uh, it's technically correct that you should always handle it, there's all there are of course the exceptions. So the answer, as in many things in programming, is it depends. Um, but yeah, there seems to be no questions. Uh, so then we can go. We actually have time to go back to the second mini task. Um, so uh, let's just go back here. So we can take a look at it. So 
uh, you can have five minutes to think about it yourself and then uh, we will just finish up with a possible solution at 9 50 and then uh, then we will finish
Okay. So let's uh, have a little look at this. I will simply create a function called mini task two. So we wanted to return a result uh, that produces an integer. Um, the error case, um, let's maybe just use the standard one. Um, and what we want to do is we want to get our number and set it to the random, red random generator and generate from one to 10 again. And then um, it's less than a value. So if number is greater than five again, let's go okay number. And else, let's go error. Um, let's use our IO error with our error kind. Doesn't really matter in this case. just use unsupported and say number is too low. Without the semicolon. So now we have our function, which returns a result with i32 and some error. We generate a number. If it's greater than five, we say OK. And otherwise, we produce an error. And then in the main function, we want to use a loop. Uh, and say uh, that our data equals our mini task two. And then we match the data and we say that if it's okay, then we want to print the, oops, the number. And in the error case, And also in the success case here, let's uh, make sure we break the loop. And in the error case, we want to print the error. Uh, so that's uh, that's the thought of it. So that uh, basically demonstrates uh, being able to produce a result and then de deal with it in the calling function. So if we recargo cargo run, we see that it prints one number, which is uh, this one. And then it, it finishes. If we take again, we get seven, nine, we get four, two low numbers. And then we get our nine. So now it failed four times. Now it failed once. Now it didn't fail. Now it failed twice, and so on. So we could imagine this being the, a user typing a number, but they're supposed to do user input. And then they get a couple of errors that we are handling. And then when they succeed, we get out of the loop and we continue with the correct number. So while we're using a random number generator here, this could easily have been just user input as well. So yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's it for today. I don't think there was... Any questions at the end? Nope. Uh, but as usual, you can go to Discord or and ask in the channel or uh, send me a message. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes left. So just I, I will just do. Um, a little bit comment on the Monday session because I had a chat with uh, Christopher <laughs> because yeah. we had th this situation of um, uh, people. Just, let me just share the screen. Just give me a second. So, uh, share my screen. Yeah. So we had this kind of uh, interesting uh, social situation where um, we had um, a question 
of how many how many types how many types a package or kind of a cargo no oh. uh, crate yeah can have right right uh and there was kind of a two versus three <laughs> <laughs> uh, and okay. that's kind of very interesting because um, we have this kind of a human language and in human language you have or and you don't have XOR, right? Uh, yeah, and yeah. with or, uh, the truth table is if you have neither of the two, so if we have a truth table A and B, right? So then we have uh, false and then if one of them is true, then we have true. If we have true then it's true and then we have true for the both right so that's or uh and then with xor um with xor it's uh if we have both false then we have false if one of them is true we have true and uh, but if both of them are true we also have false right so if you count how many different cases you have with uh, or, uh, and you use this kind of a truth table, you actually have three, right? Uh, because it can be A, can be B, or can be A and B, right? With XOR, uh, you only have two, because A and B, it doesn't count, right? It actually says that that's not possible uh, truth state. So with the crate being <laughs> uh, binary, you can have a binary crate or library crate, right? But you can have a crate, which is both. <laughs> so some <laughs> students kind of use that logic and say it's three, uh, whereas you are, actually have just two different types, but they can be or in the sort of uh, inclusive case, <laughs> right? Not in XOR case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Christopher was saying that he has the same problem when you read legal texts, because sometimes the legal text says you have to do this or this, but you cannot do both. And sometimes it says it, you have to do this or this, but it means you can do this, or you can do A, or you can do B, or you can do A and B, right? And then it results in the kind of a counting problem because sometimes you end up with three situations, sometimes you end up with two situations. So if it's like a legal text which specifies what has to happen and only two out of three things actually happen, then that's kind of a mistake, right? So he was saying lawyers should actually use XOR uh, just to distinguish the, those two cases, right? Uh, because in normal language, we don't distinguish between those two cases clearly. In programming, of course, we do. We have OR and XOR, right? Uh, but in um, normal language, you use OR for both of those situations, which is confusing, right? So just yeah. kind of a, a side comment that it was sort of funny uh, on Monday where uh, we had a little bit inconsistency of interpreting what does it mean that the crate can be binary or lip? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes uh, makes sense on a technical level. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, all right. So that's that's all uh, from for today, I guess. Uh, thanks a lot. I really like uh, the way Rust handles errors. It's much nicer to GoLang, for example, where you have to. Yeah sprinkle your code everywhere with if, if statements. Uh, so it makes life much uh, much more friendly for the developers. Uh, and also this kind of uh, ability to handle it kind of gracefully uh, or fall back to some default behavior is kind of nice. So yeah, thanks for the intro. And I hope um, people will kind of uh, link some of the concepts between uh, Rust and Haskell and also like how nicer this kind of ergonomic error handling and Rust is compared to Golang. <laughs> yeah. Or, or even to, to C or C, right? Where you do have to be quite verbose about your error. Yeah, like in C, you often just turn off exception and ignore it completely because it's <laughs> a lot better than just dealing with how it, how it works. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you very much. And then we meet on Monday. Yes.